How's it going guys? So today we're going to be going over baby care for one of my favorite species ever, the Boyd's Forest Dragon. Now I'm lucky enough to have successfully bred this species for a number of years now and I've successfully kept them for a bit longer and they're just absolutely amazing. One of the coolest reptiles we can get here in Australia in my opinion and uh, they're quite easy to look after but you just have to make sure you're doing things right. You can easily go wrong if you have the wrong information. Now this is not going to be a full-on in-depth care video on all things to do with the Boyd's Forest Dragon. This is just for keeping babies, what I do and what works for me. They're an amazing captive dragon to have because you can set up a really cool looking enclosure for them. I'd recommend everyone look into bioactive enclosures or you know living ecosystems and, and see if it's something that's going to work for you as an enclosure setup because these bioactive enclosures are really the best option for these guys. So coming to the enclosure itself, these guys are a predominantly arboreal dragon. So you want something that has some height to it. These guys will spend most of their time clinging onto the branches or vines, whatever you have in there. They like being up high and off the ground most of the time. So an enclosure that's higher rather than wider is going to be your priority. For me, I use these Exoterras. This is a 60 tall by 45 by 45. As long as they have some good climbing space, they'll use it. Now I get a lot of messages from people who are having trouble with their young boyd's forest dragons. The problems with young boyd's usually come down to two main factors and that is hydration and temperature. These guys are very prone to dehydration if they're not getting adequate water. So for me, I always give them a water bowl. They always have access to that and I spray them twice a day. Now some people say you can't keep boyd's forest dragons without a waterfall. They need a running water source because they won't drink from anything else. And that is sort of true, but it's also not. So they do definitely prefer to drink from running water. The movement really stimulates them and gets them to drink. But I've even found with my adult boys, once they know where the water bowl is, they'll definitely go down and drink from standing water. But to avoid all that, I personally think the easiest option is just to spray drink them. So you're spraying the enclosures anyway for humidity. And so you just spray the boys in and around their face. And if they're thirsty, they'll start lapping up some water. They notice that movement and it's more natural for them and simulates rain. So that's how they drink in the wild most of the time and that's the easiest way to hydrate them in my opinion. And that way you can have a simple water bowl in there that has constant fresh water. You should always be replacing that if it gets dirty and that way you don't have to waste money on running a mini waterfall all the time or anything like that. It's a lot easier and I've never ever had an issue with dehydration. Now temperature for boids is a big one. One of the most important things about keeping these animals is keeping them cool. These guys are very different to most Australian reptiles. Most Australian reptiles love being out in the sun basking, getting that nice heat. These guys are the complete opposite. You've got to look at where these animals come from in the wild. So these guys live underneath the canopy where it's nice and cool and shaded pretty much 24-7. There might be a patch of sunlight every now and then. Where they sit in the rainforest would rarely ever get over 30 degrees Celsius. And temperatures over 30 for these guys have experienced for long periods of time in captivity has been shown to be fatal for these animals so you never want it to get over 30 in your enclosure. So these main issues I get asked about are usually to do with the animal not acting right or it not feeding and these more than likely always come down to the animal being too hot so it's got heat stress, doesn't want to eat, doesn't want to do anything and then that often usually leads to dehydration as well. So. Those two things, critically important in keeping these guys. So for the temperatures I give my boys, like everything, there's a bit of a gradient. So the lights up the top, even though I don't use any heat lights, the UVB and the plant growth light put off a tiny bit of heat, whereas the top will get about 28 degrees, you know, max. And then as you come down from that, it'll go all the way down to probably about 20 at the bottom. So right around the middle of the enclosure, it's mid to low 20s. And that's perfect for these guys and really easy to achieve. And a sign that your dragon is too hot is usually they'll retreat down to the forest floor, maybe even trying to dig down underneath the leaves or anything like that, or just laying flat on the ground. Now that's not always the case. They might just be looking around or digging or doing whatever, but if it's doing that a lot, then... It could be a sign it's got some heat stress. So as far as the decorations inside the enclosure, you want to have a bunch of different branches and vines and things like that for them to climb all over where they can, you know, sw swivel around and hide behind. As well as a lot of foliage. They like to feel nice and secure and hidden away, especially at this age. Being so small, they'd be prey to pretty much anything in the wild. So I like to deck it out with a lot of plants, be that fake or real. In this case, these are real live plants and they've really just engulfed the whole enclosure and grown out really nicely which is awesome i've had to cut it back about three or four times now but they love hiding in and amongst the leaves and doing their thing so i recommend you know lots of perching opportunities lots of different branches vertical and horizontal and whatever 
as well as a lot of plant cover for them to, you know, hide within. Now, lighting is very important for these guys. Like all Australian dragons, they need UVB light. Whereas most dragons in Australia are sun-loving species that can handle a lot of UVB exposure, these guys really can't. Again, they live in that under canopy rainforest environment where it's really shady and there's not as much UVB. So for UVBs for these guys, I go with the tropical type bulbs. So that's usually a 5.0 to a 7.0. On these ones at the moment, I'm using the Arcadia 7% Shade Dweller. And on my adults enclosure, I also use the 6% T5 Arcadia. It's interesting about these rainforest species, they don't have the black lining on the inside of their bodies that covers their organs, which protects the organs from UV damage, which most dragons have, but these guys don't. So that's why a less intense UVB is required. I highly recommend getting a daylight simulating bulb, and that's going to be for your plants, obviously. So I use the plant growth bulbs. On this one, I've got the Arcadia Jungle Dawn, which is a beast of a light. It's, um, as you can see, the plants have gone nuts with it, but if you're going for the bioactive enclosure, which I hope you are because it's the best way to keep them, you're going to need that plant light. So if you're not going to use the Arcadia, you need something that's going to be 6,500 Kelvin. And I would get some sort of LED or maybe a T5 light if you're not going to get the uh, Jungle Dawn or something similar. Now humidity is another big one. Being rainforest animals, these guys like high humidity, but rainforest isn't always at 100% humidity. So for these guys, I spray them in the morning and the evening. Usually I turn the lights on, give them a spray. And while I'm spraying, I also make sure I try and spray drink them. If they're thirsty, then they can drink. And then just before I turn the lights off at the night, I give them another spray again. And doing that spray in the morning and evening really replicates well the natural humidity spikes they'd find in nature. If you look up online, you can go on online and look up habitats where these guys come from, those areas. Look at the humidity ratings throughout the day. It'll be high during the night, start dropping off in the morning, a bit less humid during the day, and then start rising again as you come into the evening. So that's what that's simulating. So you don't want it to be constantly wet in the enclosure. I like to have it dry out a bit throughout the day and that's gonna stop things like rep respiratory infections happening as well as you know mold build up or anything like that in the enclosure. It's a good natural cycle. So for substrates, there's a few different options you can choose. So if you're going bioactive like I recommend, you're gonna want a mix of stuff that's gonna sustain the plants and be good for the microfauna as well. It's gonna clean the waste of the animals. So in here, I've just got a mix of coir peat, sand, yuki mulch, some bark, and some sphagnum moss to keep that aeration in the soil. It's gonna be good for the plants and the microfauna. But if you're not doing a bioactive soil, you can simply use just some coir peat, and change it regularly. But in my opinion, if you're getting an animal that's as cool as this, you may as well go all out and do the whole bioactive system because it's gonna be so rewarding for you and them. Obviously you're gonna to need to choose your plants wisely. Make sure they're not gonna harm the reptile and they're gonna do well in the enclosure. I like to use a lot of your indoor sort of plants and things that are well known to do good in vivariums. So I've got a ficus benjamina, pothos, umbrella plant, you can put in bromeliads, all those sort of things. Now the fun part, feeding. So these guys are primarily insectivores, so they're only gonna be eating insects. They might eat a bit of fruits, you know, once a year or so, I'll give mine a bit of banana or something like that. But most of the time it's gonna be your insect. Like anything, you wanna give it a nice variety. The main thing I feed is wood roaches, but also feed crickets, earthworms, isopods, moths, and all sorts like that. Now feeding these guys is really fun, but if you're keeping multiple animals together, a good tip is to make sure you are tong feeding them. Because if you have multiples together, you'll often get one or two that become sort of dominant, and they dominate and eat all the food, hunt it all down, or chase off the other animals, or steal their food. So uh, a good way to make sure everyone gets their bit is to tong feed. And it's also a great interaction for you and the uh, baby boids. It's good fun, and helps them to not be so scared of you. So these guys can take down a pretty decent size food item. But I don't like to overfeed these animals, just like all my other stuff. I like to keep them nice and lean and healthy. Typically they'll eat until they're full and you can stop. But I usually only give them a few at a time of a decent size to, uh, again, keep them nice and lean and keen. <laughs> so I like to dust my feeders every feeding for these guys. At the moment I'm using the Arcadia Earth Pro A and their calcium supplement. So most feeds are with the vitamin supplement, which is the Earth Pro A. And then every few feeds, it's the calcium supplement. That seems to be working well. Now identifying the sex of your Boyd's Forest Dragon is really easy. 
make sure you go back and check my Sexing Australian Dragons video because I have all the information there and I even show examples on the Boyds themselves. So go check that video out. Now when it comes to handling, these guys aren't really the best species for that sort of thing. These guys are more of a display animal. They don't like to be touched that much. They stress out pretty easily with handling, but they can be pretty good sometimes as well. Depends on the individual, but general rule of thumb is these guys aren't like a beady. They aren't the animal that you take out all the time for handling and interaction. They're more like a sit and look at animal. So there you have it guys. There is a quick look at the basic care requirements for baby Boyd's forest dragons. If you'd like any more information, give my Facebook page a like and you can send me a message anytime. It's Coops Reptiles or at Coops Reptile World. And I'm always open to questions or any other information like that. So hit me up anytime. Otherwise, give the video a like if you liked it. Subscribe for more Australian reptiles, and I'll see you next time.